One time I got hit, did I tell you this story? I got hit in the head and I saw my own brain. I did. I got hit so hard in the head that I saw my own brain. I know that sounds kind of gross, but it's not really gross. <laughs> And it's not really what it sounds like, but I was wearing these and I was golfing and I went like this and I was with three guys, two, of, two faculty members from here, or a graduate, I forget who was there, but anyway, I'm standing there on like the 11th tee, like this, getting ready to hit, and a ball comes 200 yards, a guy hits a hook, it hits me in the head, right here, wha-bam, it hit so hard. The lenses of my glasses went, ping, popped out, and an immediate golf ball grew in the side of my head, <laughs> that size of it, and I went, boom, and I kind of lost conscious for a second, I went, Oh, you idiot. I looked at the guy next to me. You hit me. And he's like, I didn't hit you. Why would you think I hit you? And I went, I don't know what happened in this. So I put ice on it and I kept, I tried, tried, tried to golf a little bit more. I put my lenses back in, you know, and, uh, I, but, I, but here was the weird part. Ready? Not only did my head hurt and I had to have, you know, ice on there the whole time, uh, I, I couldn't see clearly. And it started to freak me out a little bit. So about the 14th hole, 15th hole, I was like, ah, oh, this hurts a lot. Finally, about the 17th hole, I said, you know what, I'm done, guys. Man, it might hit, because they were looking at me like, dude, you gotta like lay down or something. <laughs> That's your brain, <laughs> you know? But, um, so anyway, I, I called on the way home. I, was dro I drove my car and I was on the 405 freeway and I called my wife just to tell her, hey, Lisa, I wanna call you, I'll let you know something, man, I got hit in the head today. She goes, I thought you were golfing. I, yeah, I was. And I said, it's really ugly. So I just don't want you to freak out when I come in. I got this big old golf ball in my head. And she's like, is it bad? I go, it's really bad. She goes, are you okay? I said, well, I can't see very clearly. And she goes, where are you? I'm on the floor. You're driving and you can't see clearly. And you're and like, yeah, but what else am I going to do? So I get home. She's all kind of mad at me. Not mad at me, but like, why would you drive? You can't see. I'm like, I don't know. I shouldn't have done it. It's foggy, hazy. So she was leaving out of town that weekend, and so she goes, you gotta go get checked. And I went, I'll be fine, <laughs> which is dumb to say. So I kept, I'll be fine. And then th th by the second day, third day, she's like, Chris, you're a little bit hmm at times, but now it's even more hmm at times. <laughs> you gotta go in, and in fact, I made you an appointment to go get an MRI. Like, no, Lisa, I'm not gonna go get an MRI, Bob. Chris, that is ugly, you are messed up. <laughs> So I go in, I was all mad to go get the MRI, but my vision was so messed up that I agreed to go do it. So I go in and I get the MRI, and they, that's where I saw, saw my brain. <laughs> get it? <laughs> See, I know. I'm, but it was so, they showed me my brain like, cool, blah, blah, and he goes, yep. He goes, uh, good news, you don't have any blood on the inside of your skull, and uh, that would be bad. You have a concussion. And that's what I can tell you. I run the MRI machine, that's what I can tell you. And I go, oh, what about my vision? It's messed up, it's all foggy and I can't focus all that clear. And he goes, I don't know, I, I can't explain that one. That doesn't matter, I don't know. So I leave and I'm, and I'm all like, oh man, I didn't need to get an MRI, it wasn't all that bad. So anyway, I drive home and I decide to stop in at, a, at Lens Crafters and I walk in I say, my glasses are messed up. Oh, man, I got hit in the head, and I described, look at that, and they're like, ooh. And the lady goes, oh, I know what's wrong. You put your lenses in backwards. <laughs> so she switched them and fixed them. I went, oh, I'm healed. <laughs> I am fine. I didn't know get, need to get the MRI. I didn't need to do anything. I put the lenses in backwards. Why am I telling that story? What was that to do with anything? My brain. I don't know what that, what, what are we talking about? <laughs> This, that's a picture of my brain. <laughs> We're gonna tell, oh, okay. We're gonna talk about brains today. Is it possible that something could uh, uh, happen to us at, at a brain or even a cell level that influences our behavior like that? Now for me, it didn't turn out to be nothing other than, again, like I said, my lenses <laughs> were in backwards. And, but here's my first clue, by the way, I'll, I'll finish the story like this. The, the day before I went to get the MRI, I was watching one of my kids doing some like vent or sport or something, I forget, and I had my glasses and I turned them upside down and I went like this, and I went, wow, at least this kind of actually helps. <laughs> <laughs> How come I couldn't figure it out that I, at that point? Why did I not know that? I, and then you're like, you had your, ah, oh, that was dumb. So, <laughs> I, think, I think, okay, it's messed up. I got one more story about, brains and nerve cells. I'm, going to I'm about to tell you a story because I want to illustrate something about, about nerve cells that are very cool and very powerful. 
But it's a story, I'm gonna prepare some of y'all, it's a story about blood. And some of you don't like blood stories. In fact, I had a couple of people who have actually fainted in this class, and one guy sat right there in a class this big, and he went into seizures, because he fainted, and he's like in the middle of class, because I told this story, and it was really bad. So I'm gonna tell you a story about blood, but here's, the, here's, the, here's what's gonna happen to you. You're going to, I'm gonna ask, um, some of you are like, ooh, queasy. You could either leave, or you could just close your ears when I tell it. Does that sound good? Yes. All right. There's something about nerve cells that are kind of cool and something weird about them, and so let's do this. It, it's gonna go, here's what's going to happen. Here's some facts just to start with. I'm not gonna tell the story yet, I'm just gonna tell you some facts. I don't care if you write these down or not. Nerve cell facts. By the way, this whole system, your whole, whole nerve, are you guys ready to do nerve cells? Yes. We're gonna plow into these. By the end of today, you're going to understand what it means for addictions, for some psychological disorders like schizophrenia, and why we can now peer at a particular nerve cell and see some way cool things. They're mostly, this is a complex system built on simplicity, and I'm gonna make it very simple today. I'm gonna to give you an analogy. We're gonna use this classroom as the analogy, and it, at the end of the day, you have gotta know the analogy. It's gonna be simple, it's, not the, it's a very complex system, and there's much more to it, but I want you to walk away knowing some things. In order to do that, you, we have to pick up some of these things. So, basically, uh, at the end of the day, we're going to look at cell bodies, this basic building block. You don't need to know, but there are like, a 25 billion neurons. I'm not sure if anybody ever counted them, but they're kind of guesstimating. 164 trillion synapses, 7.4 million miles of dendrite fibers, and 62,000 miles of axons. That's a lot packed in, and it's complex. No two brains are identical, and nor, nor are two minds ever the same. And this is why this is complex, but we're going to simplify it, look at the transmission between two nerve cells, and tell you why that's the critical point for a lot of people. There's a lot of other things that are critical in the brain, but this is really where it's happening, that we're, we're learning a lot and have learned a lot over the years. So recent, some recent discoveries that I think are pretty cool, one is this thing called a mirror system. How many have ever heard of a mirror neuron? Oh, cool, let me see, Maybe, not, not a lot, um, are the mirror systems in our brain. Some of you have. If you haven't yet heard of a mirror neuron, uh, anybody know when, it, when we first found a mirror, uh, mirror neuron in, uh, uh, in a living creature? It was in, what animal did we first find a, a mirror neuron? M-I-R-R-O-R, -R -R, a mirror. It's in a monkey in Italy in 1994. Some monkey in Italy in the early 1990s who had, had his brain opened up didn't kill him, he was fine, they gave him all the proper things to do this, and they pl implanted a tiny little electrode, a, a, a microphone that listens, ready? Because every time a nerve cell fires, I told you it's both chemical and it's electrical. That's why if something's wrong with you, we take you to a hospital and we hook you up to an EEG, electroencephalogram, we're listening to the electricity in your brain. So because it's an electrical impulse, it's like a battery like a click, 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 right? So they took this little microphone, they took this monkey's brain, they hooked up these, th these very, very small, thin electrodes and they placed it in this brain and they found and listened in on single nerve cells firing. And it sounded like that, okay? Little nerve cells, they found them. And this monkey would do something and they would find the nerve cell firing. And so they found one spot when the nerve cell, ready? If the monkey sat there and reached for, let's say, a peanut or picked up a peanut and put it to its mouth, they found this particular nerve cell in this one part of the brain and it would go like this. He would reach it and go, and the nerve cell would go and it would fire. Make sense? The only time that nerve cell ever fired was when that monkey reached for that peanut and put it like that. So when the monkey went, you heard this one particular nerve cell fire. Do you guys know what happened next? They left that nerve cell, they, they marked it, they, they, they made note of it, they left the electrode there. When the monkey would move, it would go like that. Now the monkey is sitting still. That little nerve cell is not doing anything. 
And then a guy walks into the laboratory eating an ice cream cone, one of the lab assistants. And he goes like this. The lab assistant in the back takes a bite of the ice cream cone and he goes like that. And the guy on tracking these nerve cells went, oh, that nerve cell just fired. The monkey hasn't moved his arm. And so he told the guy eating the ice cream cone, do that again. Take a bite of the ice cream cone. And that guy went like this. He took a bite of the ice cream cone, and this monkey's nerve cell went, but the monkey never moved. <gasps> the guy doing the thing said, do that again. He did it again. And then he just said, the monkey sat there and watched the guy take a bite of the ice cream cone, and, and all of a sudden it went in his brain. That was a what? Why, was, why do we call it a mirror neuron? because it looked at somebody else doing a behavior and it didn't do the behavior itself, it mirrored it in his own brain. Oh, somebody does a behavior and it mirrors in your brain. If somebody smiles, guess what? They found mirror neurons in that part and this part and that part and this part of the entire brain of this monkey. And guess where else they found them? In our brains. We have mirror neurons everywhere that allow, think about, tell me what the consequences are if somebody, tell me your name? Augusta. Augusta. If, if she looks at me and gives me a mean, angry face, my brain, if you had a mirror neuron here and she looked at me and she went, oh, like that, disgust, what would happen to me? I would begin to mimic or imitate sometimes the facial expressions on another person because it's happening in my brain via my mirror neurons that when I look at somebody else, that's a single nerve cell sometimes firing. And now, tell me the implications of that. Do you see how well, why now in my brain, I'm able to almost connect with you in your brain? Because when you do something, I feel it. It's like we're in tune. They found people will have conversations and, they're, and they're, they'll be in synchrony with each other. People that like each other are in more synchrony with each other in their brain cells than people who don't like each other. Have you ever talked to somebody and you're like, I, I don't connect with him, I don't like him, I don't know him. It might be that your mirror nerve, system, nerve systems are completely off, or he's a dork. <laughs> <laughs> or this idea of really liking somebody is oftentimes because we start to do this very interesting mirroring, synchrony. That is what this cool study is about mirror neurons because we connect and make ourselves literally attuned with somebody else and that might be the very system, though there's other more, it's more complex than that, but mirror neurons that can look at somebody else and put their emotions. It's, it may be the basis, for, it may be the, the system that's used when we have empathy for somebody. If I see somebody's pain or feel it, sometimes it's because my mirror neuron. Maybe this the, it, we think it could very well be the ba basis of some of these things, like how we connect with other people, why we feel empathy towards them. There's a guy right not far from here at this little school that, um, I don't know if he's there anymore, I haven't seen him in a long time, but he's a crossing guard, and he waves to everybody. There's another guy I pass all the time on a bike, and he rides this little, kind of almost like a big tricycle, basic, but he waves to everybody. Just like this guy. So every morning I kind of drive by and he'd be at the crossing guard and he would wave and smile. And I found myself, I didn't know him. I would just be one of the cars driving by and I'd see him and what would I do? When, well, one of the things that happens is he's, when people smile and wave, we tend to smile at, 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 back at them. If, someone, if you walk up and they smile, hi, you tend to almost with your mirror neuron go, oh, hi, and smile. Not all the time, but most of the time. So I'd drive by this guy and he'd go like this. He'd wave and smile. And I found myself every morning going, hi, and waving. And, I like, and then I drive away and go, I don't even know him. So one day I decided I'm not going to smile and wave at him. <laughs> I know, I was having a bad day. I got hit in the head with a golf ball. <laughs> so I'm driving by and I decide I'm not going to smile at him. So I drove by and he smiled. I saw him in the corner of my eye and I went like this. Hi, like that. Like, <laughs> I didn't want to do that. I, try, I told myself I wasn't going to do it. And it was like a mirror neuron that just went, oh, hi. Like, <laughs> This is a system in which we start to look at and peer at, and the whole point of telling you that story is it's really cool because we can sometimes focus in on a single nerve cell that fires in situations like this, and it's revolutionizing what we're studying, how we study the brain, what happens in our brains, and that's what I want you to figure out and what we're going to do today. Yes? 
when people aren't in sync, we, we're not quite sure what's happening. Let me give you one group of people. Ready? We believe have, a, we call these our mirroring system. There's a group of people that you've heard about before that we believe may very well have broken mirrors. Who's a category of people, what's a disorder in which it might very well be, what I just told you about mirroring, smiling, looking, following, tracking, being involved with, we think these people have a broken mirror system. Autism? Kids with autism. <coughs> Kids that suffer from autism may very well, it, it may have a, a, a malfunctioning or a messed up mirror system because it's some of the things that way, the ways we connect and mirror aren't always there or they have to be worked on very, in a difficult way by people struggling with this. It, it may not be, it's new research, they're just kind of looking at it, but that, that's kind of what happens, you feel that out of syncness. Okay. This was first discovered among you, you don't have to write that down. Mimicry, when we mimic, when we bond, and when we feel sympathetic, we feel sympathy towards somebody. That, that's just the idea of mirror neurons. I'm gonna spend some time talking about nerve cells, but I, I just wanted to bring out why it's so important and why it's so cool to study this, because we can learn some cool things about us, our systems, when they work, when they don't work, when they're broken, and uh, so, we're, so that's why I think it's foundational for us to understand how two nerve cells communicate. Um, and, and why that electricity is so important, that, that listening to it, but the chemical side to that is also important, so that's what we're gonna do today. So autism and broken mirrors. Any questions as we get started on this? All right, no? All right, so let's dive into the mirror. Oh, by the way, you wanna see mirror neurons at work? This was in the Olympics last summer. Um, if you watched any of the Olympic games, uh, you would have seen, um, like people in the stands here, they took, they had a video camera on the parents of one of the gymnasts, I think her name was Ellie. Was there an Ellie Res, Resmussen? Anyway, one of the gymnasts, I don't know what her name was, um, but they, they had a camera on the parents and, and as they were, as she was doing her routine, they, how many have seen this video? This, these parents, I don't know if, I, if it's gonna play, which is really too bad because it's kind of a cool thing. So what, what ends up happening and what you'll see here if I can get this thing in real quickly, is that there was um, a, the, this camera picked up this perfect, almost cool um, uh, way in which the parents lived out that world with, this, with their daughter up front. So, okay, here it is, and I'll play it now. Look at the parent. It's almost as if these are the parents right there. Watch them as the routine goes on. There it is. Are they connected? Are they connected to their daughter? And it's the mirror system literally are living everything she does, which probably explains if you put a camera on people when they're watching a football game and they're all into it, or they're watching, and they're like, oh, they, they're literally living through these mirror, this system in, in tuned with the people out there doing the thing. That's what was happening with her. So um, it continually, to, you don't have to write this down, but it's one of the biological systems that we, that's fascinating because it continually attunes us to like an orchestra and becomes influenced by the internal state of the people we are with. Whenever we connect face to face or voice to voice, our social brains interlock, refashioning our brains. A guy named Daniel Goldman wrote a book called Social Intelligence. And this was one of the cool things he talked a lot about and, and uh, mentioned, and it's, it's a cool biological system. All right, so what I wanna do now is um, show you what's called an action potential. You, this is the electricity right there. See how it's flowing in the yellow? All it simply means is when a nerve cell fires that this electricity goes from the cell body right there called an action potential. And if you were to move your hand like this, 
that nerve cell that's out there in this motor neuron would be sending, and I could peer in and listen to that electricity firing, and that yellow just signifies the direction of that electricity and that electrical impulse, which is needed for me to go like this, pick up my finger or move it, all right? We call that an action potential. Most of you know these things uh, and you've seen it. What I wanna show you is just kind of a quick diagram of the way some of this works. And all it does is there are particular impulses that go on, and, and in fact, I'll show you this. It's called the all or none response. That nerve impulse that we call, that electrical impulse, is something that operates on the basis of what's called the all or none response. This all or none response simply means that a nerve cell either fires or it doesn't fire. That's it. It's called all or none. A nerve cell is designed as a mini communication device and it says one of two, it either fires or it doesn't. If you stimulate it with the right neurotransmitters, that nerve cell fires, but if other nerve cells tell it next to it, don't fire, don't fire, it won't fire. And it has one of two states, it fires or it doesn't. It's called the all or none response, okay? It's like shooting a gun. You don't shoot a gun and it just kind of, oh, I don't want to kill that guy. I just want the bullet to kind of go out a little bit. You know, so I'll squeeze the trigger a little bit and so I won't fire that much. Uh, a gun, it either fires or it doesn't. Fires or doesn't. That's a nerve cell. Call it the all or none response. That's important because it, as we generate this nerve impulse, it has to, in essence, what we're looking at is this miniature uh, decision making device. And that's what they are. And the decisions are influenced by the chemicals in the system, in our brain. If something is to fire or not fire depends upon this nerve cell firing. All right, and by the way, the reason being in sympathy or connected to somebody is important is also the same for in our brains. I'll talk later on about what marijuana will do as a drug to your brain. It mimics something very similar to schizophrenia in people because what happens is a part of your brain goes like this, is in tune with the other part of the brain. This hippocampus is in tune with the prefrontal cortex. And they should go like this, ba-boom-boom, 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 like that. And what happens is this symphony goes in like an orchestra, ba-boom-boom, ba-boom-boom, ba-boom-boom. The chemical ingredient in marijuana does something and it doesn't quite line up. And for some, they begin to experience symptoms not far off from schizophrenia in, in severe cases and in other cases. But it has to do with certain firing patterns, electricity. And these single nerve cells are firing in concert and something messes them up. So let's talk about what it does. Um, inside of a nerve cell, we have this, ready? We have transmission across synapses. And that's going to be the key location where these chemicals, where we're going to peer in on something called neurotransmitters, is going, they're going to occur in the gap between two nerve cells, all right? There's a gap there. So what happens is this. There's a sending nerve cell. I'm gonna call it on this side of the room over here. And if we really shrunk down at some level into a single nerve cell, on that side of the room, we're going to have, for example, a person's, we'll envision this, that we're a part of this kind of person's motor cortex or their brain, and right over here, a guy is getting, let's say, poked in the finger. Doesn't know it, is standing there, there's a poke, and one nerve cell says, oh, I've sensed, I'm getting poked, so it sends, an, it sends a message to the next nerve cell, which is over here, saying, oh, move your finger, okay? So in other words, I get poked. This nerve cell says, ah, oh, fire to a motor neuron, a muscle, back to the finger that says, move your finger. And it happens very quickly. It's electricity, and you have to know something about electricity. Electricity goes through this, down this axon right here, and so what's happening is, if we we'll look at the center screen right up here, this sending nerve cell right here sends a neural impulse. Actually, you can look at any screen, I'll just do it this way. So here's this neural impulse, and it's electrical. This is the tip of a guy's finger out here. And these, out here, these dendrites pick up this, anything, a sound, a noise, a smell, whatever it is. In this case, it's a finger that picks up somebody getting poked. And this nerve cell goes, oh, 
send the message down, and it's electri electrical going this way, and by the way, surrounded by this, um, th this thing called the myelin sheath that surrounds this axon so that the electricity goes faster. It's like, a, it's like wires being insulated. This right here is this insulation, and this neural impulse goes whoo, just like that, and then it goes all the way down here to the next nerve cell. We call it the receiving neuron. And this box right here just blew up. See this box? Make it big, show up, go down here and look. Ready? Here comes the electricity. Here comes the electricity. And what happens is it never, this nerve cell never touches the other nerve cell. There's a gap. That's where chemicals come in. You see, what does the electricity do when there's a gap? If there's any gap in a wire, if you have headphones and they don't work anymore, I guarantee you, you're spinning them, messing around with them, and that wire just went and there's no connection and you, you can't hear anything, right? If there's a gap in wire, electricity doesn't go through, right? So no two nerve cells ever touch. So there's not an electrical connection between two, there's a gap, and so electricity always stops there. Now what helps, just as an aside, what helps this electricity go more, uh, stronger, faster, more efficiently, is this myelin sheath that wraps around the axons right up there. And there are some problems when people, when they have, when there's nerve damage or they've cut some of their nerves, what's going to happen to the electricity? If you cut that axon right there, that electricity is going to stop. I'm gonna show you, it's one way we, tr we help people uh, with certain kinds of epileptic seizures, is we slice some of these axons and these nerve connections so the, so the overabundance of electricity in a seizure stops. And now the bloody story. Yes. It went like this. How many of you, have any of y'all ever had nerve damage before where you've cut axons or nerves? Okay, I'll tell you my story. Ready? It, but you don't have to close your ears yet, but I'll tell you when, because it's kind of messy, but it goes like this. One time, um, I had this, I was taking wallpaper off of a wall, and you use a blade about this thick, a razor blade, and it's about as heavy as a hammer. It's okay for right now. I, you can close your ears in just a minute. And pl please do close your ears, because, but and it, anyway, you take, so I put a new blade on there, and it's about as heavy as a hammer, and you go up to the wall, and you go like this, and you just simply take off the wallpaper after you heat it up, you go like that, and you take it up. So I put a new blade on there, and I put it on top of a ladder. And I picked up the ladder, and I stepped over a box, and now you might want to go ahead and close your ears for about one minute if you don't like it, seriously. So I picked it up, ready? I picked up the box, I stepped over, and that hammer with the razor blade went right through my wrist. And it went like this, fling, and blood. Close your ears. Blood went like this, everywhere. And I have to tell you, my very first thought was, I'm going to die. I thought I was going to die. Because it just went, fling, and I went, blood. And I went, ah, 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 like that. And I yelled to my wife, Lisa, Lisa, I'm dying. And she went, oh my goodness. I ran into, I grabbed, I don't know what I grabbed. I wrapped it around. They're like, oh, we got to go to the hospital. I'm dying like that. That's what I thought. And I tried to be cool and all, you know, like, oh yeah, it hurt really bad. And I'm going, Ah, so we go to the hospital. She goes, what'd you do? I go, I don't know. That th I told her. She goes, through your wrist? Ah, oh, I just felt like that. And there's a big old, there's a big old hole there, man. It's bad. So we go to this, finally to this doctor, and, he, and, and I get into the emergency room, and he goes, oh, let me see what, and he goes, oh, that's bad. And he goes, and he goes okay, can you move your fingers for me? Start, and I went like this. I go, he goes, start with this one. And I went, dink, dink, dink. And I couldn't move this one or this one. Oh. And I went, oh, I can't move it. Give me a pain pill, I'll move the finger. <laughs> and he goes, dude, I'll give you a shot or some pain. He, he goes, but he goes, try it again. I go, it really hurts. And he goes, just move it. I go, I can't move it. And he goes, uh, okay, you got some problems. <laughs> and I went, I can't move them. I severed them. Is that, is that what happened? He goes, mm, yeah, you've lost the connection between there. You severed right through the muscle, the, sorry. <laughs> and I went, oh, that bad. So anyway, I went, that's really bad. I lost it. So 
I lost the connection between there, blood's going out, and uh, that's me. So if you see me, you know, walk around campus like this, that's why. <laughs> and I say, how's it going? I go like that. <laughs> no, I, I can move them now. <laughs> I can still move them. So I go like this to the doctor. I say, can you fix it? And he goes, yeah, come back. I'll do some surgery. And I go, can you fix the pain? I'll move the fingers. You ain't moving those fingers, man. You, you went right through the tendons and they're gone. Like, ah. So I got this big old massive scar now because I, because I went in and they had to take six tendons and reconnect them. I'm sorry, am I making some people sick? Am I making you sick? Yeah, if you have to leave, you go. Go ahead, seriously. I know, okay, I won't say any more, but no, I have to say more and more bad things. So he, he, he brings them together, he connects them, and here's a funny story. Is everybody all right? I hope you guys are all right, just close your ears. But anyway, he takes these tendons and he puts them back together. But ready, I don't have any feeling anymore. I lost it all because I went through the axons as well, and there's a little nerve. These, see what's weird about these neurotransmitters? All the axons hook up together, and they kind of bind together, and they go like that, and it's a nerve, and it runs right through here, and I went right through it. So I have no feeling here to here, none. And then it started in the peripheral nervous system. It wasn't central. Central sometimes, most of the time, won't come back. Peripheral starts to grow back. And so I started getting a little bit more feeling, and a little bit more, and a little bit more, and a little bit more, and that was many years ago. To this day, I have no feeling right here. You could take a pen, you could take a, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. You could take a, you could take a, uh, okay, so you could take like bad things. Some, if you have to sit down, go sit down. I'm sorry, I, I, I should, I, 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 <laughs> I know, get air, it's bad. Put it this way, if I'm ever standing there and, and you could literally poke me with anything, I will never, I could be standing there and you come to me, hey, Dr. Grace, and poke me that way. I'll just keep standing there. Hey, Dr. Grace, so don't do that. Because I'll I won't know you're there. Seriously, you can go like, that. I just don't have any feeling there. It's gone. That nerve cell is reading it, but it's sending it down there. And I'm sorry. Okay, all I want to say is, by the way, the tendons are fine, my hand is fine, everything's good. It's a happy story now. So I went into the doctor and I go like this the second day, but I, I like to mess with people, you probably can tell that. But anyway, I go to this doctor who was really quiet and like this, he was like this really well-known hand surgeon apparently. And he goes like this, he, he, he called me in two days, three days later, I had to go in, he goes, hey, did you surgery? How? He, he wasn't that effusive, he's like, so how are your hands? How's your hand? I go, it's fine. And he goes, are, are you doing, are you doing all right? I said, yeah, I'm doing fine. I said, except, doc, I, th I think you messed up. And he's like, he looked at me like, I'm like the preeminent hand surgeon in the world. <laughs> and I go, no, I think you messed up. And he goes, why? What do you mean? I go, well, man, I think you switched some things. Here, I, watch. My brain says my thumb wants to move, and look what's moving. <laughs> I think you switched my tendons. <laughs> and he's like, I didn't switch your tendons. <laughs> watch, thumb, hello. He's like, no, nah, that doesn't matter. I didn't switch them. He goes, you know why? He goes, because I know things about, you know, the brain. You, you, you have what's called one trial learning. You would go like this, finger move, I mean thumb move, and the first time, your, this would move, and the second time, your thumb would move. And I went, oh, I don't know if I believe you. And he goes, you want me to do your other hand? And I went, oh, you are funny. <laughs> I do not have feeling because there's a slice there, electricity stops. The whole point of the story, <laughs> if you're like, what's the whole point of the story? is that electricity needs to continue. So we use chemicals to bridge the gap between two nerve cells, and that's why things like cocaine work. Because in that little gap, the chemical called cocaine comes in and it does something at this little tiny synaptic gap where two nerve cells communicate. And that's where people are earning a lot of recognition for helping those who struggle with Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and schizophrenia because if I look inside that little part of that gap I find a chemical and when I find too much of it you have schizophrenia if I find somebody with schizophrenia and I was able to take a spinal tap and I was able to look at the chemicals in their brain they're going to have too much of something we all have called dopamine too much but if I take it away you see, I worked in a, 
a mental institution. I worked at a uh, state hospital, ready, for the criminally insane. The maximum security ward. I worked on a maximum security ward with the criminally insane. These were very bad people. <laughs> and many of them were schizophrenic. And something would happen to the schizophrenics that I worked with when they were given their medication to stop the amount of chemical in their synaptic gaps called dopamine. When we gave them a dopamine blocker, it would make them not quite so schizophrenic, not all of them, but many of them would find relief from schizophrenic symptoms. At some cost, if we gave them too much of a blocker, they began to show shakes. They called it the shakes. Because what disorder is associated with people, if I do a spinal tap, they don't have enough dopamine in their system. It's called Parkinson's disease. And Parkinson's disease shows up with people not having enough of the dopamine and they get shakes and they start like that and their body starts to get in control. And so when a schizophrenic who's taking a dopamine blocker because he has too much in it starts to show the shakes, we know he gave him too much. That's why our systems are so wonderfully, perfectly attuned and calculated. And when things mess up, at very small levels, we start to see these things and go, oh, and somebody figured that out. That's what you're going to do and we're going to do in the next, <clears throat> next few minutes is figure out what's going on at that neurotransmitter level when this impulse comes in and it starts to show um, a way in which, and unfortunately, I'm gonna have to reinsert all these videos, so I'm not gonna do it. It's just an animation. And what's going to happen is this electricity is going to come down, and what it's going to do is, it, uh, to go back, as, it, as this electricity slides down this way, these chemicals inside of here, these little vesicles contain little chemicals called neurotransmitters, and the electricity goes like this. So when this you see somebody and they smile, a nerve cell in yours fires, and it's an electricity that starts it. It comes down like this. It op these vesicles float, float down to this edge, and they release into the gap. So electricity, now chemicals, that tell the next nerve cell to fire. And that's what we're gonna do right now, is I'm gonna give you an analogy on how this works. The key is that neurotransmitter. It's like a key, it looks like this. One of these keys. They're chemical keys. The reason I use a key is because it's a chemical key. And neurotransmitters like cocaine mimic or imitate or facilitate or fake out your brain to think it has its own keys. Unless you take ecstasy, it doesn't show, it doesn't bring in any keys. Ecstasy does something completely different. I'll tell you what that is in just a minute. Uh, uh, questions? Here's the analogy. Be prepared to write it down. Know it. It's going, to be in, it's going to be in this room as a visual reminder of what it looks like. And the gap, the synaptic gap, is right here. Right down this middle aisle way is the gap between this nerve cell, which is sending a message this way, and this nerve cell, which is receiving it. This is the synaptic gap. No electricity goes through here. The electricity stops right here. And the keys, these neurotransmitters are inside vesicles. Each of you are vesicles. Just like that bubble, each of you are like on this side of the room, one of these big orange bubbles. And inside of you, you've got chemicals, little keys inside of you. How many brought your keys today with you? Uh-huh, so you have your keys, and right now, that's what you are. You're a vesicle, you contain these keys, and you are going to release this chemical when you're, this is like a, this is like a river. It, that, that's what it is. Inside your brain, there's that fluid, brain fluid, spinal fluid. And this is like a river, and you're vesicles, and you're on the bank of a river, okay? And the only time you release your chemical key is when electricity comes and tells you, open a garage, your garage doors, open it, and release this chemical key. So you're just sitting there hanging out, with your chemicals and electricity, you're a, you're a garage on the bank and all of a sudden like a guy drives by, clicks his garage door open, it goes whoop, the garage door opens, the chemical key goes across and that's the chemical. Now it's electrical, whoop, chemical, okay? 
This is the what? This is the river. Uh, uh, scientifically, we know it as the synaptic gap. These, each of these students are vesicles or garages that contain the what? The keys, which are neurotransmitters. They're chemicals. They're chemical keys. That's why I use these. It's a chemical key. Look at, by the way, I got two different ones. One drives a not so nice car. At least it's okay. And this one gets me into an office. <laughs> two keys. They have different functions. We, got, we know there's at least 50 keys in your brain. But right now, in this location, at this spot, at this junction, there's only one kind of key you're making. You're making this one. And that's all you do. And you fire only when someone pokes you. Poke, poke, send a message. So here's what it looks like. It goes like this. Those keys cross the gap. When this electricity goes, here you are, the vesicles containing these neurotransmitters. And you open up your garage at this. You're sitting right here. And you open it up. And the chemical, these little red dots, come pouring out. Okay, And they influence the, this. Let me, I'll just give you kind of another picture. This inside here is a synaptic gap. This is one nerve cell. This is another nerve cell. Here's the gap, OK? The river. Here comes electricity. See that electricity? This now, this is not the greatest picture, but there are garages. <laughs> vesicles and they contain keys and they're just waiting for that electricity to open. Can you guys you go like that Karen? Here's a garage door it opens <laughs> and here's the key and they come across. Can you hold up your hand like this for me? Give me a fist. You can put it carefully and then could you do me a favor and put your leg right there? Put it yep, just put it huh? And could you do me do the same thing if it's, if you don't want to okay. Here we go. So, one nerve cell is telling the other nerve cell, it's firing, smile, yep, I feel a poke, uh, uh, so what, I'm moving, whatever. Or, I feel good. There's a part of your brain when it's stimulated, one message sends to the next one, stimulate that. And this one goes, great, I'll send that message. It goes over there, great, I like this. And you interpret that nerve, that firing of this cell, and that cell, and that cell, and that cell, and this pathway, and you go like this, oh, I feel good. I feel good. So, it's this nerve neurotransmitter. Ready? Something is causing this to fire. I feel good. I feel good. I feel good. So the gate, the garage door opens. You guys are the garage doors. You open, right? Door opens. The key goes across chemically like this, and it attaches to the tumbler on a lock, and it attaches right there. Oh, got it? It's a chemical key. Now it goes across the synaptic gap. Remember, here's electricity. It comes across right here. Now the garage door opens. The chemical goes across, called a neurotransmitter. It attaches itself right here. And in the river are all these backpacks. <laughs> all these backpacks are in this river. They're electrically charged ions. Sodium, potassium, they're in, if I took a look at your spinal fluid, they would be full of electrically charged sodium and potassium ions. You got it? They're the backpacks. Are you ready? The message goes like this. To send the message, I feel good, this neurotransmitter goes across. It attaches itself to this tumbler over here, and it goes like this. Ready? I'll lift your hand way up for just one second. And it goes way up here, and it goes like this. It's a chemical key. And as soon as it does it, this gate opens. The legs come down, and the gate opens, and this, but can I borrow this? Yeah. Is there any, it, will it break? <laughs> this sodium and potassium floating around here, the gate opens, and it goes like this, and it floats through the air through the goat. And then it goes like this, turns, the leg comes back up, the gate locks, this goes back and floats there like that. 
and that sent that message and this electricity, this baby <laughs> went that way and it's now in there and it's positively and negatively charged because the gate opened, we'll do it again, ready? Gate open, the electricity flowed through there. It's now, now, it's, now there's electricity, it's positively and negatively charged and if a lot of those go through, all of a sudden this nerve cell goes, do 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 fire, like that. And then it goes like again. Gate opens, uh, uh, garage door opens, the vesicle, here comes the neural transmitter, it comes across, attaches itself, the, the gate opens, and the, and the backpack goes in, the, the sodium and potassium. Sure. Okay, I'll take it back, she, she wants it back. <laughs> Do you? Do you want it back? Ready? Okay, this is called, this is the river, the, no, we're calling it the what? The, it's the river, but, we're, but it's known as? Synaptic gap. Each of the students over here are? Vesicles. Vesicles that contain? Keys. Neurotransmitter keys. There's a, they're up against the bank. They do not open their garages until there's an electrical stimulus unless you take ecstasy. Ecstasy says, I don't need no stinking electricity. <laughs> I'm just going to open up all of the garages in the nerve cells that are associated with mood and pleasure and calmness called serotonin and ecstasy goes, open up all the garages. It sends a message and all the vesicles containing serotonin go whoop, open up and whoop, here comes serotonin. And the message at serotonin goes, oh, I feel good, 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 right? I feel calm, I feel relaxed, or whatever. So, there's one more thing. The vesicles contain neurotransmitters. These neurotransmitters are called, they're keys in this illustration, but they're neurotransmitters, they're chemical keys. The backpacks are Sodium and potassium are what we call electrically charged ions that flood into the next nerve cell, influencing its electrical potential. Because it's electricity that's basically being let in. Electrically charged ions influence this next nerve cell. And that's how a chemical works. That's how it works, that's it. Electricity, chemical, electrical charged ions, now you're back to the chemical, now you're back to the electrical thing. Here's the problem. It's simplistic, this isn't a problem. But let me tell you now what this means. You now have the basis to understand how drugs work. Because this is it. With one more exception. There's a lot more complexity, but I'm gonna give one more layer, ready? One, just one more. Inside, each of the garages are not only neurotransmitters, but there's also a long next to them, kind of inside, is a vacuum cleaner. Because the key goes like this, the garage door opens, it comes across, it attaches, and if there were no vacuum cleaners, that would be messed up because it would keep sending that message. Instead, there's a vacuum cleaner, raise your hand up, or could you raise your hand up? like a vacuum cleaner, <laughs> yeah. And so it goes like that, can you make that sound? No, you don't have to. And it goes like that and it sucks it back up. It sucks it back up to be used again. Door closes, opens up, goes across, <laughs> she's getting tired, attaches, and it what? <laughs> sucks it back up. Oh, that's your brain. This is cocaine. This is your brain on cocaine. <laughs> it goes like this. Ready? The message. It, I, already? I feel good. There's a big vacuum cleaner way high. <laughs> Sucks it back up. That's how it works. I feel good. <laughs> I feel good. You take cocaine and it goes into your brain and it goes to the synaptic gap and it goes to the vacuum cleaner. Raise your hand really high to the vacuum cleaner. And it goes like this and it attaches right there. The door opens, I feel good, and it goes like this. I feel good, 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 I feel good. Because cocaine blocks up the reuptake mechanism, it blocks the vacuum cleaner. 
And so you keep sending dopamine going, I feel good, 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 until when? For four hours or however long, depending upon what kind of cocaine you take until this wears off and you pee it out of your system. You break it down and finally this comes back. Cocaine blocks the reuptake of dopamine. So you take it, it blocks the vacuum, and, it, and so that message of what should be feel good. Now here's the part where your brain makes some amazing corrections. And it goes like this. Cocaine, vacuum cleaner, stop. I feel good, I feel good, I feel good, I feel good, and this keeps going. There's nothing sucking it back up. I feel good, I feel good, I feel good. At the end of the day, that brain is going, uh-oh. I've got too many gates that are opening. I've got too much of this key. And in a simplistic way, it tells the vesicles, stop making this. Stop it. There's too much. It doesn't say get rid of the cocaine, which it eventually does. It says stop making this. So now you vesicles have gotten the message. It's feel, you feel too good. Turn that up. You stop making the keys on the, in, in you and the keys start going away because there's, because the brain's going, there's too much, too much. Cocaine now goes away, and how do you think that person is now going to feel? See, you're feeling normal, I feel good. I feel good, you have a perfect amount of dopamine in there. You take cocaine, and now you have what? Four or five hours later, your brain's made a correction, and you are now going, you don't have enough of this, and so now you don't feel good normal. You're just like, I really don't feel good. I want, what, what is that the beginning of? Addiction. That's the beginning of two things, called, two important things happen. There's an addiction that now says, I have got to get more of this. And that's true. Your brain is now depleted of this. And so the best way you can do it is, that felt good, do that again. Now, if you wait long enough, over time, your brain will repair itself and you'll start making more of these at a normal rate and then you'll feel fine. But some don't wait for that and they'll go, I gotta, get, I, I gotta get back to feeling better or feeling pleasure, and they take this. That's the problem of how an addiction occurs. It's horrible, the outcome, when someone gets this because they'll do anything to get that feeling good again. Yeah, go ahead, question. Can you kind of talk about chasing the dragon? Like, your first, your, like how you always are trying to match your first high? What happens what he's referring to is this phenomenon uh, called tolerance. And is, 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 I guess it's kind of a technical term, it's not really that. You, you guys know what it means. Tolerance means what? That first time, wow, I feel really good, feel really good, feel really good. I want more of that really feel good feeling. Does it take this amount of cocaine or more to get you there? Usually it takes just a little bit more and a little bit more, and tolerance starts to set in where you get used to this and you need more and heavier and quicker dosages of a particular chemical, and tolerance and its role with addictions and ultimately withdrawal is, is similar to that. So you get this kind of system that works extremely well, but with small little changes. Okay, let me see if you get it. Do you understand the analogy? If I gave you a blank nerve cell and I said, Point out the vesicles, point out the neurotransmitters, or point out what's the backpack. Can you, can you do all that right now? Yeah. This, this fluid gap, synaptic gap, right? Based like is the river, okay? The locks are over on this side. There goes the electricity. Here comes the locks, sitting over here with a, a gust, a, Augusta's hand, uh, uh, she, her, if you don't mind raising up, this is the lock right there. The keys come over. By the way, see the person out of the gate? Uh, tell me your name. Karis. Karis. There's Karis. That's a cool name, Karis. There's Karis's leg. The key comes across Karis's leg. There's the backpacks, those little things. See, this is a full class here. That's the backpack, pretty cool. It's ions, positively, negatively charged. Some, uh, uh, tell me your name. Kathy. Kathy? Cassie. Cassie. Cassie's backpack. Karis's legs. Here it goes. Now her legs open. <laughs> the backpack goes inside. And it now influences the electricity of that nerve cell. This is, an, um, this is awesome, isn't it? This is like high tech. 
PowerPoint. <laughs> I have it all illustrated, but my, I'm, I turned my PowerPoint off and turned it back on, and all my videos went away. So I'm now doing it by hand like this. Does, does that all make sense? You all have it written down. Ready? Then here, I can start telling you how drugs work. How many of you, yes, somebody said. How many of you all have ever gone to a dentist and gotten a shot and you feel numb? Has that, it's almost everybody. You wanna know what happens chemically? Novocaine, or whatever they put in you, by the way, you could take and poke yourself like that and you wouldn't feel it because it's what's happening. At the chemical level, Novocaine goes in, and do, do me a favor, here's a garage door, ready, like this. Novocaine goes in, and by the way, when you feel pain, when I poke you, it met the message, goes like this, poke, send the message, oh, been poked, oh, that kind of hurts, oh, like that. Novocaine goes in, and it holds the garage door shut. And Novocaine goes like this, and it holds itself right up against the garage door. Is that uncomfortable? No. Oh, good. <laughs> I can, okay, so, so Novocaine goes up and it holds this garage door just like this and it says, uh-uh. So you get poked and you're like, oh, I don't feel anything. And yet you're bleeding or what, don't do that, but you're, right? You don't feel anything because Novocaine's like, stop the garage door. So now pain goes like this. The pain message goes, and it stops. That's what Novocaine does. You now know what cocaine does. You know what Novocaine does. Antidepressants work just like cocaine. See, somebody who's struggling with depression goes like this. Well, you and I go, I feel good, I feel good, has involved something called serotonin, which by the way is what ecstasy is working on, something called serotonin, I feel good, I feel good. Antidepressants come in and they block serotonin reuptake. So it's called selective serotonin, how many know what an, an SSRI, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor? And all it does is serotonin, is you're just, in, in people who are struggling with some depression, they just don't have enough serotonin. Now it's not, not in all cases, and, and I'm simplifying things, but in many cases of depression, what they'll end up doing is giving a person more serotonin blockers, the reuptake blockers. And like cocaine, it goes like this, I feel good, serotonin, in a normal person, I feel good, I feel good, but when someone's feeling depression, there's just not enough serotonin. The way they do it is they block the vacuum cleaner that sucks up <laughs> serotonin. And so now, serotonin can go, oh, I do feel good. I feel good. I feel good. And that's the selective, ser that's a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. The vacuum cleaner is the reuptake. Does that make sense? Uh. Yes. Would that be, would that help? Well, there are lots of different treatments. We all know, we know what the underlying chemical mechanism probably is in something called depression. It's probably serotonin, right? The most common thing is to find out different kinds of things that, like Prozac, that will block the reuptake of serotonin. But yeah, some people say, well, maybe you could take some sort of synthetic or herbal serotonin to make you feel better which is probably, by the way, why some people ultimately self-medicate that influence thing, chemical things like that. But yes, as a, the idea is you could, there are some possible ways that you could influence that very system, but they're gonna have to influence that kind of serotonin. So some work, some don't, some are just kind of placebos and probably don't work, but yep, go ahead. Yeah. Where does the what go? Like, where does the, like, the electricity goes through the vessels? The the, yeah, it stops right there, and Novocaine, all it does, the electricity is still there, but this nerve cell, which is the one you need to feel that pain, is not being sent the message because that, that chemical's not going across. But what happens, like, after the Novocaine? Yeah, as soon as the Novocaine wears off, by the way, um, it usually doesn't, it, the brain, the, if used in small and appropriate doses, the brain responds appropriately and it just goes away, it's fine. Too much, things mess up. When I do this, when I move my hand, there's a certain chemical reaction. If I put too much of a chemical, and I'll, and I'll tell you about like, for example, nerve gases, seron gas, it, it, right here, this is where it's happening. 
Same, same exact place. I'll, I'll tell you about that in a minute. But with Novocaine, and m many drugs used by, that are regulated, they, they tend not to have major consequences. That's why you get, regulate these kinds of things, though. It's a great question. How about um, the anesthesia? Okay, anesthesia, I'll, I'll talk about that one in just a minute. It's the same thing. Has everybody got this? You see the little vacuum cleaners up there? They're kind of cool. See those right there? I, th I think they're cool. <laughs> little vacuum cleaner thing that sucks up the, the reuptake. See the key going up in there? It's awesome. Neurotransmitters, one more time, are chemical messengers that bridge the synaptic gap. And there are different types. Different types of neurotransmitters. Um, for example, there, here's one that is uh, very powerful. Acetylcholine, every move you make, every breath you take. <laughs> okay, let's see where you land on this one. How many think of a song when I say every move you make, every breath you take? How many can think of a song? I think you're going to divide into two groups. How many think of the group that the song Oh, tell me, raise your hand and tell me which song it is that you're thinking of. The Police. The Police. And how does it go? Y'all hum it. Every, right? I had it up here. <laughs> every move you make, every breath you take, every vow you break, I'll be watching you, right? How many thought of that song? How many thought of a different song? And what was it? <laughs> it's a worship song. Yeah. Every breath I breathe in you. Yeah. Right? I wish I could sing, I would sing it, but it'll be on YouTube and I don't want to sing. How many thought of that song? See, half of you thought of that song, that's awesome. I think that says something about your personality and I'm not going to say what. Every move you break, every move you break, every move you break, every break dance you do, YouTube. Okay, every move you make, every breath you take, acetylcholine, ready? Acetylcholine. So if I stop acetylcholine, what will happen? What will you stop doing? If I give you a, by the way, if I flood you with acetylcholine, like the bite of that, what will happen? <laughs> a black widow spider, if I bite you right here, it'll flood you with acetylcholine and your, your, your muscles will go like that. It's a black widow spider. And it hurts because it floods the system with acetylcholine when it goes in, that toxin does, which by the way is just the opposite. Because by the way, just as an example, you don't have to write this down and we're gonna end here, but I want you to know something about acetylcholine. It's immediately broken down to keep muscles from contracting uncontrollably. So acetylcholine, all right, it goes like this. After it goes in here, something comes in and breaks it down. There's a chemical. The key goes like this, comes across. Another chemical comes in and goes, <laughs> break down acetylcholine, because otherwise, your muscles go, go uncontrollably. And so, just at the end of the day, seron nerve gas, it breaks down the breakdowners, so to speak. And so your body gets flooded with acetylcholine and the victims experience very bad seizures and spasms and ultimately death, and it's all about ACH. So I'll tell you what, here's what we'll do. Next time, we'll talk about some other medications. We're done for today. We'll talk about dopamine and other neurotransmitters. So do me a favor, read up on it, be ready for class on Monday, and we'll finish this lecture on neurotransmitters. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.